So we know how an integrated circuit works that has logic gates in it. You power the chip, it has its internal connections to the gate, and you connect your inputs and outputs as desired. Nice and simple. But this is what you might call a normal chip. There's also a kind called open collector, as in the collector of a BJT, and NPN specifically. Imagine the following. So the inputs to the gate in here are as normal, whatever internal circuitry implements this gate. But imagine you have a transistor, and it's in the chip. It's in the chip. The base connection, the control connection essentially, of the transistor is the logic function. The emitter goes to ground as you'd expect, and the collector goes there. So the pin outside that you connect your output to is not a logic out like it would be normally for a gate. It is the collector of an NPN transistor, essentially a low side switch. So you would have your positive here, whatever in here, and technically it's an input, but it requires, of course, a pull-up resistor. Let's make that a little easier to see. So we connect through our pull-up resistor into the gate. Then, of course, we have our load, which also connects to the gate and down to your negative. So let's say the logic output of whatever gate in here is false. So this is a low on the end of the gate. So you've got low going into the base, low going into the emitter, not forward biased, so the transistor is not conducting, which means this is not part of the circuit and the pull-up resistor is going straight to the load. So the load is effectively connected directly to positive power. Then its resistance and voltage drops and whatever kicks in, it gets its drop, this gets this drop, it's a normal circuit. This is in what's called a high impedance state or high Z. You'll see it referred to this, high Z. That's just what they call it. They refer to impedance resistance as Z in this context. So you'll see like H for high, L for low, and Z or high Z for high impedance, which means it's not giving you a voltage, it's cutting itself off from the circuit. Essentially, it's a resistance so high that it's effectively not a part of the circuit. So either it's a transistor that's not conducting, or it's an open switch, or it's just a gigantic 20 mega ohm or more resistor that is making mostly nothing happen. When this is putting out a one, a high, a logic true, and on. You've got high at the base, low at the emitter, so the transistor's on. So through the transistor is connected the ground directly to this spot, minus the whatever minuscule voltage drop is through the transistor. So this might be 0.2 volts here. So now you've got zero to 0.2 or so to zero, and the load is essentially unpowered. And through the chip is flowing here. Now this is where you find out in the spec sheet it says recommend maximum current for low output because when it's high it's not conducting it doesn't matter it'll say the voltage because a transistor can tolerate a maximum voltage but it's going to specify the recommended maximum output low signal current and that is what this is basically you want when this is low which means it's conducting and the load is off you've got current flowing through the pull-up resistor and that's the maximum recommendation for the input as usual they're high impedance and you find that in a spec sheet when you look at the recommended and absolute maximums it will tell you maximums for the input voltage but it will not say a maximum for the input current that's how you know if you don't see if you see voltage and you don't see current that means they're high impedance which means you don't need resistors or anything you can connect directly to power and ground and internally it takes care of all the resistance it needs you don't have to worry about about it. Usually, 99 times, you're going to have high impedance input and low impedance output. That's not always true, look at the spec sheet. But especially if it's logic gates, you can generally expect this. The same way that inputs to a microcontroller are generally going to be high impedance. So that's all it is. You've got a transistor. Either your pull-up resistor is giving this its full voltage, or it's being pulled down and this is essentially off. Now why do we want this? Especially since it consumes more power. There's actually three different reasons, and I'm not going to go into too much detail right now. We'll just go into it as these applications arise, but I'll explain what it is. First of all, you control the voltage when the output is essentially true, because it's logic inverted. So you might have inverted here or whatever, but when you are receiving a high voltage here across the load. If you're using 
using a regular logic system where you've just got the gate, then that voltage is going to be whatever the chip gives you. It will be proportional to the input voltage you give it. I measured with a chip and I got about 4.3 volts with a 5 volt input, but it's still not 5. And also, you can't really power a load with it. If you're trying to power a load, you're going to be using a transistor anyway. Now, the chip I have recommends a maximum of 16 milliamps in, and I do have a higher voltage one that recommends a maximum of 30 milliamps in, but still that's 30 milliamps. If you're powering a motor, 30 milliamps ain't going to do it, and you're going to have a transistor anyway. At that point, open collector makes no sense. But when you're powering a small load, like an LED, you can certainly have an LED nicely lit with 16 or fewer milliamps. So that's one reason, is you can directly power a load. But the, the primary reason I was getting at is you control this voltage. Because right now your load is connected directly through your resistor that you control, your voltage that you control, that does not even have to be the same thing. It can be a different voltage within reason. That's also in the spec sheet. But there is a difference that it can tolerate. Because remember, the base to emitter connection and the collector to emitter connection in an NPN are separate. They're electrically connected, but they're essentially separate. So you could have 5 volts across base to emitter and let's say 7. Or you could have 3.3 volts across base to emitter and 5 through, as long as it's rated for that. The collector is going to be rated for a different maximum voltage. Collector to emitter will have a rating. Base to emitter will have a rating that can be different. And this is used for connecting different logic systems. You might have a logic system such as TTL. This usually operates at a high voltage of 2. And it can go higher, but it's generally 2. And then you could be using some other system that requires 5 and 0. So you could have 2 through there and 5 through there if that works for your chip. So the first reason is to control the voltage exactly. The second reason is for something called wired AND and wired OR. So if you have multiple open collectors, it's basically multiple transistors. So you've got multiple switches connected. Remember how we make a simple AND gate with a low side switch? Let's say we have three open collector outputs through our chip. So the pins are going to be this one, this one, and this one, and then your actual chip is over there. So you've got these three outputs. So each of these is a low side switch. If all of these are not conducting, if every single one of these is not conducting, then you have your pull-up resistor. So the pull-up resistor is connected to all three of these. So what happens if we hook up our load to the junction of all three of these? Now these three don't care that this is connected because it's just going to take whatever power it needs when it conducts. When all three are off, the pull-up resistor, see these are all high impedance now, so the only circuit is basically this, so the load is getting the full voltage. If any single one of these turns on, then you've got a connection through to ground, which pulls this down, and this is going to read low voltage for any of these. So that's called a wired OR. If this one is on, as in conducting, it would be logic zero internally, but let's just say on is conducting. If it's conducting, or this, or this is conducting, if any of them are conducting, it's going to pull the load down and essentially turn it off. So without any other gates, you've got just a chip taking up the chip's worth of space and your traces on your PCB going to here. So you have one resistor and that one resistor is giving you an OR gate for free. And it's also an AND gate. You just have to invert it. So if you want to use this as an OR gate, you just check. If this load is off, then one of these is on. If this load is on, then all of them are off, and there's your OR gate. You just have to interpret that voltage however you want. For an AND gate, if any single one of the inputs is false, the AND is false. The only time the AND is on, is true, is when every single input is true as well. So what you can do is have the opposite inputs. So normally you want to tell if the AND is true by checking for all of them on. But what if you flip it and you check for all of them off? Now you have the OR gate. So whatever these inputs are, whatever this output is, all you have to do is flip it computationally because the end user doesn't care what voltages are going on in here. All the user cares about is did the thing happen? So if software is outputting these signals, then you can just output the opposite signals in software. If you have these hooked up to switches, you can just hook up the other voltage to the switch. If you have like a single pole double throw, 
just flip the two connections to the throws. And then the same thing down here, whether the load's on or off, you can operate based on whether you want on or off to do something. So that's why it's both a wired AND and a wired OR. You just have to flip the inputs and you get an AND. If you don't flip the inputs, you get an OR. And there's one final thing. It's called a bus. So the same thing. The circuitry is no different. Again, if any of these is on, then the load is off, right? If any of these is conducting, the load is not conducting across, which you can detect and do whatever. So let's say you have three different devices or sub-circuits or ports or anything, and it's bad if these things start trying to talk over each other, you get all kinds of crap. But what if you want a signal, a nice and simple signal? Any device at any time can set a value here that says, yo, I want to talk. And it doesn't start talking yet, it just sets and says, okay, I want to talk. So essentially you have your wired OR. If any of these wants to talk, we know that, and then the circuitry can be activated that goes through them one by one or whatever to figure out which one wants to talk and it can go in a priority and say, okay, let me check this one first. Oh, that one wants to talk. Let's worry about these other two later. So if more than one wants to talk at the same time, there's no different signal. It's just, does any of them want to talk? And then the circuitry can handle from there. So it's a nice, easy way to combine a signal for activity with only a resistor, once again, power consumption, but only a resistor, into a sub-circuit to turn on a sub-circuit and say, yo, let's go figure out who wants to talk. So you don't have to pull them. That's the big thing. You don't have to go, are you ready? 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 It just says when it's ready. And if more than one is ready at the same time, before this one actually checks, then nothing bad will happen. So that's why Open Collector. In my little collection of chips, I got the 7403, which is a quad two input NAND Open Collector. Basically, it's the 7400 with Open Collector. Similarly, I've got the 7405, which is a hex inverter the same as the 7404. And then we've got 7406, which is hex inverter, just like the 05, except it's high voltage. This one, instead of being rated for 7.7 .7 volts or less at the collector and 16 milliamps or less through the collector, it's rated for 30 volts at the collector, that means across the collector to emitter, and 30 milliamps through, or even 40. There's different versions. Mine, I think, is 30. And then 7407 is a hex buffer. Hex inverter and hex buffer are the same thing, except the inverter, true becomes false, false becomes true. The buffer just passes true to true and false to false. Remember, the purpose of a buffer is to separate a signal. So the signal can go one way, but not the other. And that one is also the high voltage. So that's what I have. I'm sure I will find many interesting uses for these chips in the future. Until then, be seeing you.